Who is the best indie game developer in the world? It's actually a loaded question because the term indie casts such a wide net across the gaming industry today. You have some studios that are only a few people like Megacrit who made Slay the Spire and on the other hand you have a studio like IO Interactive who have recently reclaimed their independence and are much closer to 300 employees. And this is a very big difference and there are many studios like both. For this list, we will only be looking at the more classical term for an indie studio that will help keep the list tight and focused with only studios that are smaller in nature. Bigger game studios are already getting enough attention, but what about the smaller ones that are making fantastic experiences? For this list, we considered nearly 30 of the best and brightest indie game studios, made sure that they were eligible based on the rules that we laid out beforehand, and then rated them against one another to find out who the top 5 indie game studios are. All it takes is one amazing game to take a studio from an unknown to top of the list or another excellent game in their portfolio, which means that this list could be very different a year from now. But in 2021, here are the best indie game studios. Similar to the other studio ranking lists that we have made for PlayStation Studios, for Xbox Game Studios, and even our third-party studios rankings, it's important to lay out some rules beforehand. Rule number one and most important, the studio must be independent and privately owned. And while this might sound strange, there are actually plenty of small indie studios that are owned by much bigger corporations like Cambo Santo, being owned by Valve, Night School, and their recent acquisition from Amazon, and Clay, who were acquired by Tencent earlier this year. Rule number two, no one hit wonders. We are only going to be including studios with at least two games developed and published within the last calendar decade. And this would eliminate a team like Team Cherry, who have been hard at work on the ultra anticipated Hollow Knight Silk Song. But as of right now, they've only released Hollow Knight. Rule number three, the studio needs to be fairly active, which means the studios only with two games over the past calendar decade will be included. And although a decade might sound like a long time, Developing games is a long and slow process that takes many years to fulfill the original vision, and this means a studio like Playdead won't be included because Limbo came out in 2010. Rule number four, there will be a recency bias. This means that the last effort means the most and carries more weight towards the studio's final score, and this is going to be achieved by multiplying their most recent release score by 1.1. Rule number five, this list will be console focused, meaning that the release of a game needs to be primarily console based. But this means that no exclusive VR, no mobile, no PC only games are going to be included. Our final rule, rule number six, only studios under 100 people will be considered as any bigger and you're technically outgrowing your indie competition and you're now being judged against much bigger studios. Depending on which No Man's Sky is taken into consideration for this list, Hello Games could have been higher on this list or not even included at all. They just missed the top 5, but when No Man's Sky launched back in 2016, it was a decent game with aspirations that might have been higher than what was marketed. The concept of being able to travel to an almost endless amount of planets, 18 quintillion to be exact, and possibly never meeting another human player sounded extremely promising. Unfortunately, Sony gained publishing rights for the game and might have marketed the game as something different than what it was. At the time, the PlayStation 4 was still looking for as many exclusives as it could find as many of their high-profile games were still in development. Hello Games was a very small studio composed of just a handful of people with big ideas, and before No Man's Sky, the team was only known for Joe Danger, and it should have been expected that this would be a high-budget idea with an independent scope. Many people felt burned from the lack of promised features and things not being as advertised and, as a result, critical reception floundered. However, in arguably one of the greatest turnarounds in gaming history, Hello Games went silent and to this day have worked to deliver the vision that they had initially. VR, multiplayer, base building, cross-platform vehicles, and even next-gen support for the Xbox Series X and the PlayStation 5 have all come to No Man's Sky since. Without a doubt, Hello Games took the fate of their company into their own hands and worked very hard to establish themselves as a studio that is capable of making big games, more importantly, is the kind of studio that is going to stand behind its product. Hello Games' next title is in development, but learning from their mistakes of the past, they plan to remain silent until it's fully ready for release. 
Founded by Joseph Ferris in 2014, Haze Light Studios have made a decent mark on the gaming industry in just around seven years and only two games so far. And this has been done by making two very smart decisions along the way with quality gameplay. Similar to the way that Nintendo pivoted after the GameCube and went with the Blue Ocean strategy where there was less competition, Hazelight have found a niche area of gaming where they can remain unchallenged for the time being. Hazelight's focus is on providing high quality co-op narrative only experiences and currently there isn't anything else like Hazelight's offerings at the moment. Sure, other games do co-op but they don't build entire games including mechanics and direction around it. A Way Out was a very fun couch co-op experience that had an interesting story about a couple of guys trying to break out of prison and did quite well commercially selling over a million copies in its first couple of weeks. Hazelight continued their success and according to Ferris in an interview with IGN and to the surprise of EA, It Takes Two has sold around 3.5 million copies to date. The other smart decision that Hazelight has made is that they have gotten their games published under the EA Originals label, and that seems like the best of both worlds. In many reports, and even from Joseph Ferris himself, EA is only looking to recoup their costs and the rest remains with the developer. Obviously, having the benefit of a huge company like EA publishing your game is that they have a much greater marketing reach than a smaller publisher. The progress that Hazelight has made from their first game to their second is quite a stark difference as It Takes Two has an average review of 89 compared to the 79 for A Way Out. It Takes Two also sold a million copies within the first month and as of today has sold over 3 million copies. And what's even more impressive about these numbers is that the game includes a friend pass which means that only one person has to buy the game and you can gift a friend to a code so they can play the game with you. It Takes Two sales will likely grow steadily higher as the Game of the Year list begin rolling out late November and early December as the game will likely be in discussion as one of the top games of the year, resulting in a sales boost for those who have yet to play the co-op adventure. And moving forward, we can continue to expect more of the same from Ferris as he says, there is so much stuff to be explored in these narrative experiences. One of the most anticipated indie games for 2021 was Nobody Saves the World from Drinkbox Studios, but how did the studio get here? It started in 2008, Drinkbox has become known for making excellent 2D Metroidvania series Guacamelee, a series that was heavily inspired by Metroid, all of its exploring and character power-ups, and then adding in some great co-op elements as well as some brawler gameplay. Although sales figures can't be found publicly, the original PlayStation exclusive was received well enough that five years after the first, the studio released a sequel. One of the great things about Drinkbox Studios is that they don't seem to be content with resting on their laurels. The company is interested in challenging themselves with new art design and new genres. Their first two games were Tales from Space series, which is a side-scrolling puzzler. It was well-received, that saw great critical reception, and with its second release in 2012, many outlets put it on the shortlist for the best handheld game of the year or best indie game of the year. Moving on to their second genre was Guacamelee tackling the Metroidvania genre by paying homage to the Masters of, while adding in some co-op and brawling flair of their own. Both games were received extremely well from critics with scoring well into the 8s and many scoring it into the 9s. Looking into the future, Drinkbox plans to take on their third genre in just over a decade with the Xbox exclusive Nobody Saves the World that was revealed during the Xbox showcase in early 2021 with a late 21 release date. Nobody Saves the World is a top-down action RPG where you control nobody who is able to change forms throughout the course of your procedural dungeon crawling. The game looks to be a massive departure from their past two genres, and if history tells us anything, Nobody Saves the World will be a diamond of an indie game. Every year, it seems that more indies are being considered for Game of the Year and getting more exposure than ever, and with Microsoft behind this game and hopefully adding it to Game Pass to get it into more people's hands, the addition of online co-op to a Drinkbox game, I think Nobody Saves the World looks very promising. The only downside is that the game was delayed until early 2022 so that the team could take a little longer making sure that the game released is the game that matches their vision. What used to be Helix games became Matt Makes games and is now extremely okay games which is a very bold pivot to make after the critical success of Celeste and Towerfall. But the decision obviously shows how the studio has grown over the years from the ideas and talents focused around one person to a much more team oriented approach.
Towerfall obviously didn't gain much attention when it was initially released as an Ouya exclusive, but it would soon be released for the PlayStation about a year after and then many other consoles after that. It was on the console that it gained warm critical reception and a decent fan following with great success for an indie title. Polygon named Towerfall among the top 25 games of the decade, which is high praise considering all the amazing experiences that we've had over the past 10 years. As much success as Towerfall earned, it wasn't until Celeste that Mac Makes Games was truly put onto the map as a studio to watch. In 2018, Matt Makes Games released the Tough as Nails 8-bit platformer about a girl who must scale a mountain and all that gets in the way as a metaphor for dealing with depression and anxiety. It was a very refreshing and awakening story about the struggles of mental health, while at the same time having great visuals, excellent soundtrack, and a near-perfect level design. The levels became increasingly challenging, but always within reach of the skills that the game provided you. As a result of the excellent design across the board, Celeste was a critical and commercial smash. Not only did the game sell over a million copies, according to IGN, which is very impressive for any game, let alone a very small indie title, it put it on the Switch and it felt like this is where the majority of the sales came from. Celeste also won Best Independent Game at the Game Awards, while also being nominated for Game of the Year alongside titans of the industry, Red Dead Redemption 2 and God of War. According to Matty Thorson when speaking with IGN, their upcoming game Earthblade will be nothing like anything that they have done before and is also using their internally developed physics engine. Earthblade was announced in early 2021 as a vibe reveal trailer and that likely means that it is still very early in development and based on the art and the music that was shown, it could range in any type of game from a Zelda style adventure to a Dead Cells roguelike or an Ori Metroidvania. Very little is known. But with the track record of the studio, expectations will be higher for this project than anything else they've developed thus far. Easily one of the most consistent studios on this list and everyone's favorite indie darling studio, especially after Hades, Supergiant Games have made a great name for themselves in just over 10 years since they were founded in 2009. Bastion, Transistor, Pyre, and now Hades have established Supergiant as an elite indie studio. Although the first three entries are all spins on the action RPG formula, it wasn't until Hades that Supergiant explored a new genre that the studio became a household indie name. Hades took the roguelike formula and added a deep level of storytelling that unfolds upon each run that drives the player to not only go farther during each run as per tradition in the genre, but to learn more about each character and yourself. It's been said a thousand times already, but the game's combat felt responsive and crisp, the story was engrossing, and the design gave the player plenty of freedom. Who did you want to ally? Who did you want to upgrade? What weapon did you want to use? The answer is irrelevant because the game was so well refined that there is no wrong choice. The refinement was thanks to nearly two years that the game spent in early access on the Epic Game Store that coincided with the launch of the platform, which would prove to be a boon or a win-win as the Epic Game Store had a fantastic exclusive and Supergiant Games had some great exposure during their early access, and this exposure would lead to an abundance of positive word of mouth that would lead to nearly 700,000 copies sold during the early access period. Following nearly two years of early access, Hades released as a timed exclusive for the Nintendo Switch, which was yet another excellent choice by Supergiant Games, as they likely not only secured some extra funds for the studio due to the exclusivity deal, but with the Nintendo Switch being such a runaway success and the perfect place to play indies, this was another match made in heaven. And according to GameSpot, within just the first three days of full release of the game that coincided with the launch of the Switch, Hades had now sold over a million copies taking into account what it had sold during early access. Hades wasn't just a commercial success as it was also a critical success that would go on to win many awards including Game of the Year from many different award shows and at the Game Awards it won the Best Indie Game and Best Action Game. Moon Studios is likely to be the team on this list that is most likely to be acquired first, having developed two games published by Microsoft and with Xbox Game Studios in a frenzy of acquiring studios over the past console generation, it seems like only a matter of time. And although for their third game, the studio has partnered with Private Division, a Take-Two subsidiary, to publish their next game. Moon Studios is known for their fantastic work on the Ori series, Ori in the Blind Forest, 
was a diamond in the coal mine that was known as the Xbox One generation. Blind Forest oozed with excellence at every facet of the game. It was visually stunning and likely the best looking Metroidvania of all time thanks to an amazing art style and art direction. The world was alive with the background being almost important as the foreground. Ori and the Blind Forest was much more than just a visually stunning game as the score and the gut-wrenching story worked harmoniously and despite its cute looking protagonist, Ori and the Blind Forest was emotionally rich. Art and story also would be wasted if the gameplay wasn't outstanding, and it was. The controls and level design were near perfect, the pacing always kept you engaged, and the set pieces that were spiced throughout were a true spectacle to watch, even if you had to do them multiple times. It was released during the Xbox One generation when Microsoft had stepped away from revealing exact sales data, but the founder of the studio told GameSpot that the game was profitable within a week of release, which led to a sequel and a bump in size for the studio as they ballooned from around 20 people for Blind Forest to about 80 based on the success of the first game. Ori and the Will of the Wisps didn't quite make a big splash like the first game did as it came out of nowhere, but it was another exceptional Metroidvania that added enough new elements and a fresh story to be worthy, and was also among the shortlist for best game of the year. It was a great swan song for the Xbox One as it released just mere months before the Xbox transitioned to a new generation. If there is one criticism to be thrown at Moon Studios, it would be that they have only made two games and both of those games are in the same series in the same genre. Yes, those are arguably two of the best looking and best playing Metroidvanias around, but they are essentially a very similar game using a very similar skill set. There's nothing wrong with being great at one thing, but when looking at most of the studios on this list, they have all shown the ability to produce excellent games in different genres. The good news is that their next project is a departure from what Moon Studios has become known for. In a recent job posting spotted by Video Games Chronicle, Moon Studios is hiring for an action RPG, and as they said, after redefining the Metroidvania genre, our next goal is to revolutionize the ARPG genre. You have a love for all things Diablo, Zelda, and Dark Souls, and other games in the genre. And these are some bold words, and although I don't think that they're going to cause a revolutionary change for ARPGs, I think the potential of what they can produce is very exciting. If you enjoyed this video, please consider subscribing, leaving a like, and let me know in the comments below what some of your favorite indie studios are.